So since I was last here with you all, uh, there's been a fire has swept through our property. <laughs> uh, fortunately, the, the house is still standing and many of the trees and many have, have uh, been burnt down and some we don't know yet. We'll find out in the spring if they have survived or not. So we've been on a little adventure <clears throat> going off um, evacuating to the city and uh, having a bit of time not knowing whether there would be a monastery to come back to or not. And it's an interesting process. And, and behind me here, there's um, there are two Buddhas. So there's the, the Black Buddha, which is a very beautiful Buddha image that was given to Ayasen Tsuchita and I when we ordained at Spirit Rock. And resting on that Buddha is um, a, a charred, melted Buddha, but still a Buddha that was given to us when we left Amravati, given to us by Ajahn Sumedho. So that, uh, that charred Buddha was in uh, a yurt that is no longer a yurt. And uh, that uh, one of the sisters who was in there before the fire looked around a little bit and found it and, and brought it out and put it on the shrine. So we keep it there to, um, you know, just to reflect on the, it, in a way it, it holds something quite beautiful. So it's, you know, it's not, aesthetically beautiful or maybe it is um, and it holds the it holds the the blessing actually that was given that with which it was given when we when we left Amravati it holds that blessing from the Sangha and it holds a reality of you know everything that is formed has to fall apart and decay and that is the, the nature of things. So it's, it's embodying that truth. It's, it's both embodying the blessings and the generosity and also the, the impermanence and the uh, fragility of life. So fortunately, it was, uh, you know, only a metal Buddha that was destroyed and not, you know, human lives. And, and even the, the animals that were, we were used to seeing here have come back so they're still here so that's nice little baby deer and uh, even a few new characters some some young bucks and uh, I, I saw a big lumbering bear last weekend that I hadn't seen before so they're all around um, so this this experience really brought home to me in a in a deeper way the uh, that there really is nothing we can hold on to. So it's funny, though, those words, they're so, you know, they're like, how, how many times have we heard that? You know, and I've been a nun a long time, I've heard that so many times, it's like, of course, of course. And then when you have those brushes with, um, you know, maybe you have a brush with death or with, with serious illness or with a, with a, a disaster, you know, it's a, a natural disaster, it kind of comes more deeply into the heart. It's like that the reality of that settles more deeply into the heart and mind. So it was an interesting and quite peaceful experience, this, uh, this process of having to evacuate and, and not knowing whether you know, the monastery would survive or not. And uh, it's an interesting thing, you know, co-founder of Aloka Bihara, and then, oh, so if there's no Aloka Bihara, then, you know, okay, that's gone, that, that identity's gone. And, uh, you know, like attachment to the library, so I'm teaching, I'm teaching here from the library, and I have a kind of a fondness for this library, and some of the books came from Amravati, some came from friends in California, some from Spirit Rock Meditation Center, and some books have gone off to prisons. And there's this kind of, there's something rather good of, I like about this library. And it's like, oh, I might have to just let all of that go. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, for me, 
as we were evacuating also you know that like saying our last goodbyes to the property because you don't know if you're going to come back or not and, and sort of saying sending blessings there's this sense of like oh that might be this might be the last time you know this might be the last time I see this and actually before we even got to that point you know being indoors and packing things to evacuate you know minimal stuff and then picking things up and like shall I take that you know no I'll leave that but maybe this oh, this is kind of precious I can let it go you know so this this process of recognizing that we have to let it all go sooner or later and then being outside and um ready to get in the cars before we evacuated and and um recognizing you know could be the last time i see these trees this building those deer you know and then you know like oh yeah that has to be let go of and then this body it just became so clear and then and then the flesh on this body has to be let go of and the, the bones have to be let go of it's it all has to be let go of and there was a freedom in there there was a peace in that because it's because it's true so it's been a, a kind of a unexpected gift in a funny kind of way this uh, caldor fire um and we've had some losses um and that's life so it's just you know reflecting on the the teaching of the buddha where he's he's reminding us very clearly that everything we hold on to sooner or later we have to be parted from that everything that's dear to us sooner or later we have to let it go everything we don't want we want to get rid of will go away at some point you know all of that is it's whether we want it or we don't want it it is going to end so um loving and letting go so it can be that we, we it can be that when we when we look at that we start to get afraid because we we want to, you know we want to have stability and security and safety and we want to be with our dear ones and you know we want what our, what we love to last it's that's natural and uh, and then so we might we might either want to reject that truth of impermanence like i don't want to think about that i just want to love in the moment and not think about that but when when we try and push something away a, a truth as big as impermanence when we try to push that away it gets very stressful it gets uh, it's, it makes us a little crazy because we're trying to be at odds with reality so that teaching of, of change, of flux, of process, of, of transience is, is a, an essential teaching. And I feel the teaching of love is also essential. Not everyone agrees with me on this one, and I don't mind. I love them anyway. But I feel the, the teaching of, of love, of the Brahma Viharas, of, not just the Brahma Viharas, but... There are many ways that uh, love is um, pointed to and encouraged in the Buddha's teaching. And that that's an important part of our relationship with this life and, uh, and each other and, um, and the path. So there's the the five precepts is the first thing that comes to mind that we love ourselves we care about ourselves enough we respect ourselves enough to live in a way that is not causing harm either to ourselves or to others not intentionally causing harm this is a this is a form of love and we can't always get there immediately sometimes it takes a little while but this is a 
this is a, a manifestation of love when we're we're not intentionally taking the life of living beings we're not stealing we're not um, committing sexual misconduct we're not abusing others taking advantage of others we're not lying we're not getting confused through drugs and alcohol we're allowing our mind to be clear to see things the way they are so this is an aspect of love in my understanding and uh, generosity you know being being generous this is an aspect of love Patience. Patience is a, is a big one. It doesn't always feel like love, and, and, but real patience does come from love. You know, not real patience is like grit your teeth and bear it and wait for it all to be over. That's not real patience, that's kind of endurance, perhaps. But patience, it's like, okay, mm -hmm, yeah, all right. You know, it's maybe like grandmother love, you know, the love that's seen a lot endured a lot knows knows a lot and can be patient so these i see as all forms of love and then there's uh, uh metta the uh, loving kindness or loving friendliness karuna compassion or a, a wish for beings to be free from harm and any intention to harm. Mudita, the, the love that rejoices in the goodness and in the success and the well being and the beauty of others. And uh, Upeka, the, the love that is aligned and attuned with the way things are, that knows the, the whole picture, the beginning, the middle, and the end knows the vastness of uh, you know, the big the vast picture of the cosmos and the and the ever-changing nature of things and the you know, recognizing and, and time that just like um, that knows that everything that has a beginning goes through a process and has an ending. So Upeka is, is peaceful with all of that, knows that, you know, the, the world is far from perfect, that this practice isn't about trying to make the world perfect. It's not about trying to make samsara, this endless round of rebirths into something that's perfect, because that's an endless job. But it's about understanding it. And while we're here, bringing the best that we can, showing up as best as we can. And that changes, you know, that, that can get better and it can dip and it can get better again. And, and we can uh, transform gradually so that what we bring to this world and this life is, you know, the best, you know, something good, something that's a blessing, even if it's just to our cat or the tree that's growing outside our house still good so the buddha says even if you throw away the water you know, for us you know the water that we wash our arms bowl with even if we just throw the water away with the intention of may this benefit beings this is already good so we look for opportunities to uh, to align our hearts with that with that goodness and that love and that generosity And uh, we recently um, looked at a sutta, and I'm sorry that I don't have the references handy. Um, we were looking at a sutta that was um, where there was a, a man who was looking, who was recognizing, oh, the world is, you know, everyone seems to be either, you know, running after sensual desire or, or kind of stingy of heart, you know, there's, and, uh, and so this, this person's looking, wondering, is there anybody out there who isn't like that? You know, is there anybody out there who's not 
um, you know, seeking sensual desire or, or, you know, or is stingy, has a stingy heart. And, and um, so he asks, he's like looking around and he asks someone and, and this person says, oh yes, there is, I know one person. There is this one person. If you go into the forest there, there's this monk called Gotama, who's uh, free of, of sensual desire and stinginess of heart. And so this person goes to find Gotama, the Buddha, and uh, receives the teaching from him. And, uh, and you know, his own heart is awakened and uh, realigned by this, through this teaching. And this teaching really stayed with me. And it's like, wow, this is a very, very helpful teaching. Because on one hand, it's saying, you know, if, if there ain't many people out there who are free from those qualities so knowing that it's like you don't have to feel bad about being a bit stingy or being overwhelmed with sensual desire but you can get interested in it so it's not obviously you know following those two qualities don't get us further on the path they're, they're not aligned with the path they, they pull us off track and you know until we're quite far along they're going to show up. So uh, I found that a very kind of helpful little teaching and it's, it's invited me to look more carefully. So, you know, when is sensual design? And, I, and, then, and for a mo in a monastery, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's very well set up to notice when sensual desire arises because there are very few outlets for it. So for one thing, it's not getting stirred up too often, which is quite helpful. And also when it is stirred up, you, you've got time to notice it. And in uh, lay life, I think it's a bit more difficult and there are more um, allures, uh, but you can, still, you can still get familiar, you can still know it, you can still notice. And there are times like, you know, when you, when you look at your phone, when you, when you slip into social media, you know, do, do you just get lost in the, do you find yourself like three hours later wondering what you actually went in there for in the first place, you know? That's one wet place you can notice like a, a, a leaking, a sort of a falling into sense, the senses, the eyes, the mind, the, set, the ears perhaps. Um, um, eating is another one that's very interesting. If you can slow down around eating and just see what's going on. What's going on? What goes on before the eating? What goes on in relation to different different morsels on your plate you know and just watching it when do things speed up you know maybe when that chocolate is there things start speeding up and oh gotta eat that you know or maybe there's a version so just to get interested and then with this stinginess of heart i found that so interesting i don't see myself as a particularly stingy person these days maybe i was once upon a time but kind of less so nowadays and um but I've been noticing moments where that there'll be that little like that little kind of contraction. Now I don't want to be generous in this moment, you know. Like some some uh, we, recently we were in a situation that the three bikunis here we were visiting another place and and uh, the conditions were quite difficult. We were given rather difficult conditions and it was partly because of COVID and but it was kind of almost like not tenable for life you know it was like we're gonna we're gonna get really sick if we if things don't change soon it was kind of difficult um for a while and uh, and i found myself my, i found my heart kind of getting stingy of like a little bit resentful that we weren't being treated very well and, and it wasn't very very thoughtful and and um and then i noticed that stinginess and so i i went and sat in the car which was uh, the warmest driest place available at the time and uh, and just looked at that it's like do i want to cultivate that do i want to cultivate that quality of stinginess towards these people and it's like no i don't i don't want to have that in my heart actually i don't want to that's not what i want to cultivate so then just really consciously seeing in the storyline that was leading to that stinginess they should and we should and uh, you know it shouldn't be like this and okay there are these storylines and they make my heart contract 
And if I change the story and uh, recognize like, okay, maybe people aren't being very thoughtful and maybe they don't really know how it is to, to be in this situation. And, and, um, and so you kind of, you know, let them off the hook and then, and then take care of what's here. So I don't want to live with a stingy heart that's small and contracted and resentful. And so then breathing into the heart space, metta. Can I have metta for these people, these good people? Breathing into the heart space. And then it would open a little bit and then breathing a bit more into the heart space, that would open a little bit more. Until at some point, not too difficult, it was like, Ah, oh, that's better. Now I can be with this kind of sense of well-being in myself. And I can meet the conditions as they are without the add-on, you know, without putting on top all of the shoulds and the shouldn'ts. So, you know, so I've, since, uh, since reading that sutta, that, that comes up again and again. And it's not big, not in big ways. You know, I don't get big shutdowns these days, although I, I used to. Um, but it's more being interested and in, in attuning to that. And when we identify with it, then it's a problem. You know, if it's like, I'm not supposed to be a stingy person, then it becomes problematic because then it's like, it starts to be a battle. But um, there is no stingy person and there is no good person. There's just a process going on here. So sometimes that process leads towards contraction and sometimes it leads towards openness. And so learning to guide the process in the right direction. And sometimes, you know, one has to sit with the stinginess or the, or the shutdownness or the resentment for a while in order to see like, hmm, that's not the greatest way to be living. I don't think I really want that actually. And, uh, you know, all relationships, this is something I've, that's become clearer to me since living in the US for some reason. Um, I don't know why exactly, but all, all relationships, it's become clear to me, it's probably, it might even be obvious to you all along, but all relationships are dynamics. It's never about the other person. It's never only about the other person. So all relationships are dynamics and, and we can't change the other one or the other ones but we can change this one. We can change what's going on here in our own heart and mind. We can question the storylines and drop them or replace them for, for more beneficial ones. And uh, sometimes it takes a while. Don't be in a hurry, but be persistent. This is my recommendation. Don't be in a hurry to fix it, to fix, you know, the, certainly not to fix other people because it doesn't work, but, to, you know, don't be in a hurry to fix your, your fears or resentments or, uh, you know, to, to be the other side of them where it's all over, you're over with it and you're a good person now. Don't be in a hurry to get somewhere in that way, but be persistent in meeting them in meeting them and questioning them and uh, mm -hmm. teasing them apart a little bit, getting interested in them and, and seeing if they can gradually let go. So to me, loving and letting go are very, very much connected. The love supports letting go in my experience, may not be true for you, I don't know. And, the, and, and you know, resentment, hatred, stinginess, greed, these things, they all, they create a much stronger sense of self. They, it's like the self is, it's like the, they're the foundations for the self, actually, for the, for the ego. So it's, it's built on those things. And as we transform those qualities, there's greater freedom, there's greater alignment with reality. 
there's less a, of an investment in, you know, how we look or how we appear to other people or, or that we get our way or that we're right. We're the only right. Everybody else's right is wrong. You know, all of those things, they don't have any way much to hold on to as you transform them through, in my experience, through attention and care and love and, uh, and clear seeing, seeing carefully. So when we really pay attention to what's going on, the, the Dhamma is revealing itself all the time in everything, it's always here. We just have to align our lives with the, with the truth and then it starts to become more and more clear. Thank you. So I'd like to end the recording now and uh, open up for any questions or comments.